Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Okay. At the coffee break is by Morozumi, and the title is up here: Time Evolution of Lepton Numbers. Please. Okay, th thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, we can see you, and we can see your slides. Okay. Can you see you, your slides, my slides? Uh, it's still a little bit low. Can you turn up the volume somehow? Okay. Can you hear me? This is good. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Takuya Morozumi from Hiroshima, Japan. And today's title is Time Evolution of Lepton Numbers of Majorana Neutrinos in the Schrodinger versus Heisenberg Pictures. And this work is based on the uh, collaboration with Nicholas Benoit and Yuta Kamura, both from Hiroshima University. And thank you very much for the invitation. Okay. So let me introduce my talk. <clears throat> so lepton family number violation of neutrinos is of great interest. Uh, examples are neutrinos flavor oscillation and uh, neutrino less double beta decay. We are interested in the time evolution of the lepton numbers by turning on the neutrino mass term both Majorana and the Dirac type. In this work, I focus on Majorana case. In nature, an example of the time evolution is, a, for example, cosmic neutrino background, so-called CNB, which comes from the era of the decoupling from weak interaction which corresponding temperature is about 1, a, 1 MeV to the present temperature, about 2 Kelvin, which is 10 to minus 4 EB. For example, for the neutrino with the rest mass about order 10 to minus 3 EB have experienced from the relativistic regime to non-relativistic regime. Under the time evolution, uh, which occurs through expansion of the universe. In the previous paper with uh, Apriyadi Saram et al, published in PTEP, we studied the time evolution of lepton number, lepton family number, which LT, by constructing the Heisenberg operator for it. Uh, for one playback case, lepton number at t equals zero, which is given uh, with mass massless left-handed neutrinos. And the neutrino operator, before neutrino mass is switched on, is expanded by annihilation operator of neutrino and creation operator of anti-neutrino. So with, this, with these operators, lepton number is given by the number operator of neutrino minus number operator of anti-neutrino. The underlying assumption of the derivation of the time evolution of lepton number is the Majorana mass, which is denoted by M, is turned on at t equals zero, and continues to be non-zero for positive time. 
So the master Lagrangian given by using the step function with respect to time given as this. The time evolution of the uh, annihilation operator of neutrino is given by this formula. Uh, here, H is a H Hamiltonian is a free Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian for a massive Majorana field. And the time evolution of annihilation operator for neutrino is given by this formula. So this is the uh, superposition of the not only annihilation operator, but creation operator of the, uh, with the opposite momentum is mixed. And uh, you get the similar formula for the anti-neutrino annihilation operator, which denoted by BP. So using these Heisenberg operator, we can compute the lepton number operator at positive time t. So that is given by a dagger a minus b dagger b. And we can just substitute this formula. Then we can express the lepton number at time t in terms of creation and initiation operator defined at uh, t equals zero. Here, momentum integration p are uh, divided into two parts. Uh, one corresponds to the uh, hemisphere of the momentum directions that is denoted by this part. And this part is contribution from another hemisphere. So by substituting that expression, we can compute the uh, Heisenberg operator for lepton number. So formula is given by this. Uh, first line corresponds to the uh, uh, proportional to the lepton number at uh, time zero. But you have the uh, time evolution factor. So this is not constant. <coughs> uh, another part contains uh, uh, two annihilation operator or two creation operator. So we take the expectation value of this Heisenberg operator and uh, with some state. We choose the <coughs> uh, one particle state, neutrino state with momentum Q that is called the Psi. And this vacuum is annihilated by the uh, uh, annihilation operator for neutrino and create uh, annihilation operator of anti-neutrino. And uh, this is a normalization factor so that the state is state norm is becoming unity. So by sandwiching this state, we can extract this part by replacing momentum P to Q. So this is the expression of the expectation value. And that formula can be uh, simply expressed in terms of the velocity of the velocity of the neutrino. So that is this formula. First part, uh, VQ is Q over EQ, that is the velocity. So first part, constant part is VQ square and uh, Oscillating part is 
proportional to one minus v q, v q square. And uh, M is the Majorana mass. So we plotted uh, this expectation value uh, and the uh, horizontal line is MT. This is time. And, uh, and uh, we plotted for three cases. For a relativistic case, that means that uh, velocity is near to one, right velocity. Uh, that is shown in the magenta line here. And uh, the lepton number vibrates small because this constant part is dominant, but uh, vibrate small amplitude, but very fast because gamma factor here is very large. So relativistic case expectation value slight uh, uh, states around uh, one, but vibrate very fast. And for uh, blue line corresponds to the velocity is one over root two. In that case, constant time is just one half and the cosine time is also one half, one over two. So then uh, lepton number is uh, range, range is zero to one. So this is the blue line. And for a non-relativist case uh, that correspond to uh, velocity is uh, 0.1, then cosine part is dominate. So then it, it oscillates slowly, but with a large amplitude. So that leads to one to minus one and oscillate that way. So previous formula and uh, uh, figure uh, obtained by using the, by constructing the Heisenberg operator for lepton number. But today's talk, we are going to look at the same problem in the Schrodinger picture by constructing the uh, time evoluted state. So our goal is to show the expectation value is the same in both pictures. Left hand side is the uh, Heisenberg pictures and right hand side is Schrodinger pictures. And uh, this should be shown by knowing the time evolution of the initial state or Heisenberg state. That is a uh, definite lepton number one and uh, momentum Q. So we want to look, we want to find the uh, state time T with the time evolution uh, unitary operator acting on this state. NQ is just a normalization constant. So in order to find the time evolution of the initial state, we needed to rewrite the state with operators for mass eigenstates, which I call AM. That is Majorana annihilation operator for momentum Q and helicity lambda. Lambda can be taken be plus minus one. And also we can use a, a vacuum for massive field, which is annihilated by this operator. 
This is because uh, under presence of mass time, time evolution is simple in the uh, mass eigenstates. So this is the relation between the uh, two set of operators. One side, A and B is uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino uh, annihilation operator. And they are massless. And right-hand side is that uh, Majorana, Majorana, massive Majorana field annihilation operator. Because Majorana, Majorana particle has a two helicities, degree of freedom is the same. Here, cosine two phi p is correspond to vp velocity that is given by this formula. And cosine phi p is given by this. And sine phi p is given by this. So <clears throat> in the relativistic limit, sine phi vanishing. So that implies that uh, annihilation operator of neutrino is that uh, minus chiralities, uh, minus chiralities, uh, minus helicities, annihilation operator for myelina particles. And uh, uh, annihilation operator of antineutrino correspond to in that limit, uh, plus helicity myelina particles. But uh, in general, in general case, uh, uh, annihilation operator for neutrino, in annihilation operator in, of neutrino, uh, both creation operator and uh, annihilation operator for negative helicity and creation operator for uh, with the mod opposite momentum uh, is mixed. So we have two different set of the uh, annihilation operator. So vacuum also have two vacuum. One vacuum uh, denoted by zero, that is annihilated by A and B operator. Another vacuum, which I call zero M, is annihilated by a massive operator. And uh, vacuum with null, null, null lepton number is the uh, is written by direct product of vacuum. Uh, so the, this subscript P of the vacuum implies only the creation and annihilation operators with the momentum plus minus P act on the vacuum. So that is the direct product of vacuum. And this zero P is not uh, vacuum in terms of uh, Majorana, Majorana operator. That is the superposition of the uh, Majorana vacuum and the four Majorana state and the two Majorana state. That is written by here. So here I explained. 4M to MP correspond to the two pairs and one pair of a Majorana neutrino with opposite momentum. So they are defined by uh, using the uh, Majorana, one Majorana pair creation operators. So this operator called B dagger creates the uh, 
two Majorana particle with opposite momentum. Because we have uh, two helices plus, plus minus, so maximally we can uh, we can create two pair of uh, Majorana my, my particle on the backyard without uh, the, uh, uh, with consistent with the uh, power principle. And uh, to M state, to M state is that uh, just uh, one pair superposition of uh, one pair of Majorana particle. So this vacuum annihilated by uh, massless neutrino operator is superposition of uh, these three state. So by knowing the uh, vacuum, uh, we can find that uh, uh, state at time t. That is shown here. So QT is the uh, given here. QT correspond to the state which evolved from the uh, uh, this state. That is T equals zero. So not only vacuum, one particle state is no more one particle state in the Majorana states. So this shows a dagger Q act on zero is a one particle state that is cosine part. But additionally, we have the uh, pair of Majorana particles. So one particle state and the three particle states, the superposition. So time evolution of this, this state is easy because every particle has the same energy. So we can just count one particle state of the uh, time evolution phase corresponds to exponential minus IEQT and uh, one particle state and additionally one pair of Majoran state is exponential minus three IET. So that factor is a factor. Hi. Hi. Okay. And uh, this, this is a, a vacuum part. Vacuum part is also evoluted because uh, like this way, this is uh, obvious because that is a uh, four particle state and two particle state is mixed. So in this way, we can explicitly construct the uh, state at time t. So let's talk things is that we just take the expectation value of uh, uh, lepton number operator in Schrodinger representations. So lepton number is, must be written in terms of Majorana field. So, so that is written like this form. N, M, N is a, a number operator, correspond to the number operator for uh, uh, Majorana neutrino with minus helicities one. And this is a plus helicities part contribution. In addition, we have the uh, 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 which is not written in terms of number operator. And we sandwich the, uh, this shredding operator with psi t and the contribution coming from just this part. And we get the 
exactly same answer as uh, Heisenberg pictures one. Maybe the result is obvious. So because formula is the same, I don't show the figure again. So let me conclude what we have done. So time evolution of lepton number is investigated in Schrodinger pictures. And the expectation value is the same as that obtained by Heisenberg picture. And it says the large amplitude and slow oscillation for a non relativistic case, and the small amplitude and fast oscillation for a relativistic case. And that the vacuum with null lepton number, which I denoted 0p, is a superposition of vacuum for mass eigenstate 0mp and a pair of myelin particles 2mp and two pairs of myelin, two pairs which denoted by 4mp. So that is written by uh, three states three states the superposition. Similar to the vacuum, one particle state with uh, lepton number one is superposition of mass eigenstate and uh, a state with an additional Majorana pair. And these non-trivial non superposition of state with different energies give rise to the oscillating behavior for the expectation value of lepton number. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes. Hi, Chuck. How are you? <laughs> uh, Hi. Gustavo, yes. I'm asking uh, what are the applications of, uh, of this formalism, if possible, to leptogenesis models? Is there any impact? I mean... You're asking leptogenesis? Yes. I mean, if this can be applied to, to leptogenesis after all. That's. Uh, or you mean, right, for example, right handed neutrino? For example, yes. Hmm. If the lifetime is sufficiently long, maybe. Ah. Okay. Okay, a final question. Hi. Thank you again. It's a very clear lecture. A father. Is he uh, no. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear. Can you hear me in the in the audience? Let's see. Unshare your screen, please. Can you Good. see me now? Okay. Can Let's you hear me? Already debarring gravitational waves from neutrino mass genesis. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. Is okay. Okay. Got it, thank you. Okay, so... Uh, okay, very good, so the... I will uh, go to full screen. Okay, so first of all, let me thank the organizer for inviting me. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there personally. Uh, as Steve explained yesterday from Southampton, they didn't lift the restriction to travel abroad. Uh, that's a shame because when Nick invited me a few months ago, I was discussing with him before, I, I was uh, really looking forward. But as we know, sometimes uh, great expectation have to face a tough reality. And talking about great expectation facing a tough reality, we have heard about this a few times uh, also today that uh, what is the situation that uh, if you were a 
looking at the situation at the beginning of 2000, the two main, uh, I would say, expectations were to find the Higgs boson at the LHC, but also some theory addressing the naturalness problem and uh, with the main candidate being uh, supersymmetry. So I invite you to have uh, a read of uh, these interesting um, proceedings of the first Hertz lecture at DAISY. At that time I was a postdoc and uh, I remember at the end of the Hertz lecture, someone asked, what if we don't see anything at the LHC, maybe just the Higgs? And that's exactly the situation we are facing now. And the answer was, uh, well, younger physicists should figure out what to do. So we are in that situation now, and then therefore we should figure out what to do. Fortunately, uh, nature is providing us maybe new alternative routes to new physics beyond the LHC, uh, even though, of course, we have heard uh, in the last days that uh, flavor anomalies might still uh, uh, hopefully uh, indicating new physics uh, uh, in, uh, at the LHC. But there are also alternative routes. Yesterday, from the Pecatori, we heard about the possibility to test new physics with the ice cube, and uh, more generally, I would say, with the, um, the discovery of uh, very high energy neutrinos. But another important discovery that is attracting attention, of course, is uh, gravitational waves. Uh, right now, we are observing events that um, typically are interpreted as astrophysical events, merging of black holes of um, uh, one neutron star. Some people speculate that some of these black holes actually might be primordial, so we might already be seeing uh, new physics in, the, in that sense. But uh, there can be also the possibility that uh, gravitational waves are messengers of uh, very early universe physics, since uh, the very early universe is, is not opaque to gravitational waves as to photons. So gravitational waves are a very, uh, are a very privileged um, uh, messenger in this case. And that's why they are important for very early universe physics. So what can produce a stochastic background? In that case, they will show, us as, will show up as a stochastic backgrounds and there are different proposals. But for, um, I will focus in my talk on the um, possibility that uh, strongly first order phase transition produce a, a stochastic background of primordial gravitational wave. Um, and uh, I particularly like this proposal. I will, I will tell you why. By the way, the first to propose this possibility was with himself. And actually in this paper, he also was uh, showing how pulsar time arrays might have uh, been a, uh, a nice way to test uh, very low frequencies. He was adding in mind chiral symmetry braiding in QCD, but uh, as we will see, pulsar time arrays will play a role in my, in my talk. So the, uh, uh, clearly, um, the, 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 the poss this possibility was first investigated within the standard model, but we today in, in chiral symmetry braking indeed, and also of course in electronic symmetry braking, but today we know that uh, actually in the standard model, this transition has happened occurs as a symmetry breaking occurs as a smooth crossover. Uh, most of the attention is focused on electronic symmetry breaking, both because you can address uh, uh, naturalness, having new physics there, and because of uh, also you can have uh, electronic biogenesis in connection with uh, new physics. So new physics, um, can uh, enhance the strength of the phase transition and can uh, lead to successful uh, electronic biogenesis. Moreover, so therefore you have a kind of uh, attractive package, you address naturalness, also matter and antimatter asymmetry, and also um, you can have, uh, WIMS can give you a candidate with a WIM miracle, is an attractive way to produce the dark matter. Unfortunately, the strong constraints on at the electronic scale from uh, LHC run two, uh, as, as we said, they, let's say, let us doubt about this package. And in particular, in, in, in all respects, naturalness, we miracle. Uh, for electronic biogenesis, it's, it's probably, in, it's not excluded completely. There are uh, still uh, some idea, but let's say it's not anymore as compelling as uh, before, probably. And the people like me are considering also the possibility to see new physics at different 
um, energy scales. Which energy scale? Well, actually, I, I will have a completely agnostic approach and I will consider this as a, a free parameter, basically. So actually the experiment in, uh, hopefully should give us information on the uh, scale of new physics. Uh, in that case, uh, gravitational stochastic way background, ba uh, backgrounds are particularly interesting because uh, typically, well, you have a, sp a spectrum, you predict your uh, spectrum, and uh, typically there is some characteristic frequency at the emission. And then uh, simply by redshifting this frequency, you have um, an imprint an observed frequency today. So for example, the, if, you, if you take uh, that the, the emission is at this star at temperature of 100 GV, so at the electric scale, and if you take this parameter, that is the ratio of the fr characteristic frequency at the emission to the expansion rate at the emission of about 100, these are typical values in electric symmetry breaking, you would expect a signal in the millihertz range that will be tested by LISA. So usually indeed people in electric symmetry breaking, they say the, claim, the usual claim is that LISA can test, uh, might test electric symmetry breaking. In our case, we, are, we will be interested in phase transition in the dark sector and we will see that actually this statement will be changed. So why I like phase transition? Because there you really have a very clear uh, characteristic frequency given by the peak frequency. And then it's really like tuning the, the knob. So if you investigate different frequencies, you are actually accessing different uh, energy scales. Now, this plot is obtained within a specific uh, model, but uh, it, it is a, this is, a, let's say, a general, uh, a, a general situation. Clearly, we have to calculate the spectrum and uh, we should specify what is the scale of, this, uh, of the, new, the new physics. First, let me give you a very brief general uh, discussion, a very basic one. So well, essentially you impose a symmetry in, a, in, in your Lagrangian and um, uh, then this will be broken, but at high temperature, the, um, you have symmetry restoration above a certain critical temperature, and essentially you will be in a metastable in a metastable vacuum. In our case, the symmetry we will impose will be uh, um, U1 uh, lepton symmetry, as the previous speaker also was uh, uh, considering. And uh, so we will impose this symmetry. So at high temperature, the lepton number is conserved, and then well, while the temperature drops down. Uh, you have symmetry breaking and finally lepton number will be uh, broken. But this is a uh, very general. The critical temperature, so in the first order phase transition, you develop at, a, at some temperature T1, a new, a new vacuum um, that end up to be the true vacuum below the critical temperature. And uh, the phase transition ends at the destabilization temperature when this coefficient becomes uh, essentially becomes negative. Uh, the phase transition temperature we will see is uh, a little bit ambiguously defined, but let's say it's something between Tc and T0, and I will call, refer to it as a T star. This is uh, relies on the validity of a perturbative expansion. So in, in the electric symmetry breaking, that was meaning that the Higgs mass should be smaller than about the W boson mass. And since that is not the case, we needed a lattice calculation to establish that indeed there is no phase transition with the current Higgs mass, but a smooth uh, crossover. Then from the effective potential, you have to calculate the Euclidean action to, in order to get the bubble nucleation per unit volume and per unit time. And uh, nicely at finite temperature, the calculation of the Euclidean action reduces to the calculation of the spatial Euclidean action. Uh, and solving the equation of motion with uh, certain boundary conditions. So at R equal infinite, uh, the field is in the, um, essentially in the metastable vacuum. Uh, and uh, also the derivative at R equal zero should, should vanish. You can solve this equation and this is the typical solution, bound solution or bubble solution. 
that, for example, in the thin wall approximation is the, can be described by a King solution, where you have a bubble wall that is uh, moving with a bubble wall velocity, and the bubble wall has a certain thickness. Now, from the Euclidean action, you can calculate. You have to calculate the gravitational wave spectrum, and uh, typically this depends on three parameters: on the temperature of phase transition. In an approximate way, this can be identified with the nucleation temperature, where uh, the probability what? that it... what it must. Sorry, is that a question? Continue, please. Okay, so the, with the nucleation temperature, where the probability that you nucleated at least one bubble is about one, but this is a rough approximation. More precisely, you should identify it with the percolation temperature, where the fraction of the volume occupied by the... Can I continue? Yes, please. By the by a certain fraction of the aluminum is occupied by the force. And there is a certain uh, ambiguity in this definition, but uh, let's say fortunately in our case, um, uh, where the phase transition is fast, uh, there is no much dependence on this uh, ambiguity. Uh, uh, and uh, so we are in the case where the duration of the phase transition is very small compared to the age of the universe. And therefore this parameter beta over h star, where beta is the rate of change of the nucleation rate, is uh, much larger than the expansion rate. In that case, you can easily calculate from the Euclidean action, beta over h star, taking the derivative at the star. And uh, also you can easily calculate the strength of the phase transition given by the rate of the latent heat that is freed during the phase transition to the total energy density. Uh, after, so the, usually, as I said, there are uh, numerical simulations and there are uh, numerical feeds. This is one feed we adopted that is uh, now a, a little bit uh, uh, old, but uh, there have been many developments. Um, and so that I have to warn you so that there are many corrections and fast developments in, in this field. So let me say that anyway, the spectrum will depend on uh, this uh, fundamental parameter beta over h star alpha. Then you have to know the efficiency factor telling you how much of the energy goes in sound waves. By the way, in our case, there are typically three contribution to uh, the spectrum. But in our case, the dominant one is given by the sound waves that are uh, created when bubbles squeeze the plasma among them. And this efficiency factor also, this is the result of a numerical fit. Moreover, we use a so-called Juguet solution that depends where the bubble wall depends only on alpha, while more sophisticated approach, in more sophisticated approach, it will depend only also on the friction parameter. So when I show these plots, therefore, uh, you should think these are an indication and there are strong theoretical uncertainty. So, my results will be more like a proof in, in, in principle. So I didn't tell you which new physics uh, I'm advocating, but um, so as we know, we have to extend the standard model to explain cosmological puzzles and also neutrino masses and mixing. This can, neutrino masses and mixing can be done. We discussed that in the last days, of course, just introduce, introducing Dirac masses, but I will buy the simplicity principle that uh, Gustavo was uh, proposing and say, um, uh, so saying that if you want to explain the lightness of neutrino masses and why large mi mixing angles in the leptonic sector are large, and also importantly, if you want to address in a simple way cosmological puzzles, then uh, the introduction of Majorana masses um, can um, essentially give you a simple picture where uh, the lightness is given by the CISO formula, you also predict the existence of very heavy CISO neutrinos with um, the, all the masses are Majorana particles. And you can address the origin of matter in the universe with leptogenesis. And also one red neutrino could be a candidate of uh, dark matter. So what I, then therefore, the origin of the Majorana masses could be associated to a phase transition. So in particular, um, we are uh, within a Majoran model 
where you impose a UL1 symmetry and uh, you introduce a, a complex color field. And so you have a Lagrangian respecting um, UL1 symmetry. And at the end of the phase transition of this uh, complex color field, after symmetry break breaking, the lepton man number is violated. You can expand the complex color field about the, the valve. And the Majorana masses, the, um, your right hand neutrino will acquire a Majorana mass. I will uh, consider a common Majorana mass that if they are degenerate, is the, exactly, is the common Majorana mass. So if they are very hierarchical, we will see it will coincide essentially with the heaviest right hand neutrino. So this is uh, what I will refer to as the CISO scale. Typically, so I will assume that this asymmetry, uh, this phase transition happens before electron weak symmetry breaking or close to it. So after it, you will have uh, the usual electron weak symmetry breaking and uh, also neutrino get a Dirac neutrino mass matrix. Uh, so after both symmetry breakings, the finally the light neutrino masses will be given by the CISO formula. Notice that at the CISO scale, given the neutrino oscillation uh, experiments uh, and the values of the atmospheric and solar mat um, neutrino mass scale, you can show that the right-hand neutrino will be thermalized prior to the phase transition and will contribute to the thermal potential I was showing before. So we have a situation where you have a dark sector given by the right-hand neutrinos by the uh, Majoron, that is uh, uh, in this case uh, uh, a massless uh, gold Goldstone boson, and then you have also a massive boson uh, S, and then by the visible sector that in my case is given just by the standard model particles. A minimal model, you start from a sombrero potential, uh, then you broke the U1L symmetry and you have a, at the end a massless Majoron. You also have this uh, massive boson S, you see there is a warning here, you better let him decaying, let this decaying, otherwise you overclose the universe into, and this can, but, in this uh, case, it can easily, you can easily arrange in a way that it decays into, for example, into the lightest right hand neutrino. And then the one loop finite temperature will have a polynomial form. I give you the expression of the coefficient to highlight. Well, first of all, notice that the, the cubic term is non zero only at finite temperature. And then other things to highlight is that. Uh, the right hand neutrino, as I said, contribute to the thermal effective potential, uh, to, bo to the, to the in, in particular to the destabilization temperature, but also they enter the coefficient in the quartic term with a negative sign. So that means that you will have an upper bound on the number of right hand neutrino from uh, stability of the, of the potential. You can't increase an arbitrarily, and this will have play a role in, my, in the results, as we will see. Excuse me, Pasquale, five minutes. Yes, so in the minimal model, you can calculate analytically the Euclidean action. This has been done a long time ago. And if you calculate the gravitational wave spectrum, this is a scatter plot, you get values of the parameters that give you a spectrum that is many order of magnitude below the sensitivity. So you have to do something. We try different deviation from this minimal model. Uh, you can see the paper for the full discussion, but tell, let, let me tell you immediately what is the most, uh, the best case is to add an auxiliary scalar. This is a well-known trick in the case of electronic biogenesis. So we took this, we borrowed this trick from, uh, from electronic biogenesis. So you add an auxiliary scalar that I call uh, eta. You can introduce new terms, and in particular, this term now can give rise to a cubic term at zero temperature that is non-zero, and this is well known, can uh, greatly enhance the strength of the phase transition and also the gravitational wave signal. Uh, also, you can calculate still analytically the Euclidean action, so everything is quite simple. And as you can see now, we can access values of the parameter space where uh, at high temperature, you can start to be, uh, to enter the sensitivity region of these future experiments. These are the, the blue points because here I'm assuming a CISO scale and a phase transition scale that are equal and above or equal to the electronic scale. Lisa, what is this red point? If you want to 
have uh, access LISA, uh, actually you need to lower the scale to the GV scale. So, so far I, I was assuming that T star was larger than the electro scale and that uh, the phase transition scale was coinciding with the CISO scale. So the CISO neutrino get a mass at the phase transition. If I relax the phase transition, I can lower the C, but still keeping this assumption, I, I can lower the CISO scale at the GV. Uh, still, you can show that the random neutrino will thermalize prior to the phase transition. And this simple uh, modification can enhance the signal. And also they can shift the frequencies in the range accessible by, by LISA. By why the signal is enhanced by more than one order of magnitude? The simple thing, simply because now the degrees of freedom of the plasma is halved. And so the weight of your dark sector increases with respect to the, to the total energy density of a factor two, essentially. But the power spectrum has a huge dependence on the on the on alpha with the, as a fifth power more or less so two to the fifth gives you more or less this uh, 30 factor enhancement and you have the shift so notice that the typical statement that lisa will test electroweak pyogenesis in the case of phase transition of the dark sector is not exactly true actually still interestingly it will uh, probably test a CISO scale around the GV and there would be a nice interplay with a GV scale scenario that can be, because this red and neutrino can be tested also uh, at detectors where you have, um, from B meson decays, for example, uh, detectors like phaser that has been now approved by, by CERN. So there is a nice interplay between particle physics experiment and gravitational wave experiments. Two minutes. Apply two minutes. Yes. Now let's also relax the assumption that these two scales coincide. And actually, I will keep the CISO scale large, larger than GV, but I will uh, uh, still lower the scale of the phase transition. So this is done in this way. So the two, two CISO, CISO heavy neutrinos are at the CISO scale. Their mass could be, but this is not important now, could be generated by, for example, the phase transition of this auxiliary scalar field eta. Well, we are still interested in the sigma phase transition at low scale that will give mass to, the, to some light right and neutrinos that in the number of capital N minus two. By the way, let me just say that that could be interesting. If you have both phase transition, you can have a double peak signal, one peak at high frequency and one at low frequency. That will be a nice signature actually of, the, of this. So now you have to decouple the dark sector. And when you decouple the dark se sector, so now the dark sector is given by n prime right and neutrinos, where n prime is n minus two, j, s, and also eta, and the visible sector is given the, by the standard model particles. When you decouple the dark sector, then uh, the temperature of the dark sector is not ne necessarily anymore equal to that of the visible sector. And if you assume that this is coupled at the CISO scale and then it decouples, you can calculate from entropy conservation what is the ra this ratio. Uh, so if this star is still uh, at the electron scale, it will be 0 0.33. And now these are uh, simple modifications suppress the signal. If you lower the scale of the CISO to 1 GV, this ratio grows to 0 0.4 and uh, the signal will increase again by a factor 30. So you could say, why don't we re-thermalize with some process the dark sector at low temperature and uh, impose RT equal one to increase the signal because of cosmological constraints. You can't do that. Otherwise, you will uh, produce too much uh, dark radiation at BBN and uh, at CMB, and there are strong constraints. So the real, if you are conservative, the most you can do is RT 0 0.6. And in that case, you get this signal. However, I mean, this is, uh, you could say you are still out, by the way, out of reach. Uh, you cannot yet explain the nanograph claim, nanograph 12.5 ER data, uh, the, the claim as discovery of stochastic background, but you can enter sky and area. Only that, let's say this case, what is the re process first? And uh, you are, 
at the real edge with cosmological constraint. There is a, another and the last one scenario I want to present and, and conclude that is motivated by the Hubble tension. And the Hubble tension is a tension between the Hubble constant measurement from CMB and the measurement from supernovae. And this tension cannot be solved just adding extra radiation. You can reconcile these two measurements if you add extra radiation at the level of 0 0.6, 0 0.7 neutrino species, but then you will spoil the success of, C, uh, uh, of, um, of the lambda CDM in reproducing the CMP data. So the trick is to introduce an interaction between uh, the Majoron and the neutrino, for example, that would uh, reduce the sound horizon at recombination at the same time. And uh, this will not touch the CMB acoustic peaks, but will reconcile the upward constant measurement. What is nice is that you still have zero, you motivate this ratio of temperature. Now, even the neutrino are modified. The ordinary neutrino becomes uh, colder than in the standard scenario because they thermalize together with the uh, dark sector. And you can increase also the number of N prime uh, without having a too much, too big extra radiation. The problem is that if you go to 10, beyond 10, you, you get in trouble with the stability of the potential. So as I told you, this upper bound counts. As you can see, uh, then uh, you have different possibility. Uh, you are still uh, below a nanograph, but, uh, and this is my conclusion. So, so have in mind that uh, there are big theoretical uncertainties. And by the way, a few days ago, a paper appeared claiming that the signal can be greatly enhanced by taking into account primordial fluctuation. And uh, so I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Just a comment, yes. Uh, Pascal, this is uh, no, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I want to ask you something. I mean, there is this uh, turbulent contribution, right, which are beside the sound wave and the vacuum uh, contribution, the vacuum transition. I mean, uh, uh, it seems that this can be determined only by some simulation. I think uh, there are some groups in the United States working on that. Uh, so how important it is in this context? That's the first question. The second is, uh, um, I mean, it, it seems that uh, the predictions of these models are, I mean, it won't be easy to, you know, make discern between different models, assuming that, you know, this experiment like LISA or ELISA would be able to find, uh, to detect these, uh, uh, this, this phase transition. So, I mean, it would be in some sense possible to really make a distinction between these things? between these possibilities? Yeah, okay, for the first question, yes, you're right. Actually, numerical simulation, they don't distinguish in a clear way sound waves and turbulence contribution. So this is a numerical fit and where you see that the sound wave contribution uh, dominate in a phase transition with those parameters uh, that we obtain with alpha that is smaller than one and beta, actually, it's quite large. It's around uh, 1,000 rather than 100. And then, yes, as you can see, yes, if we see a signal, what new physics? Uh, well, as I said, I like this, this because uh, the peak, at least it gives you some, uh, uh, some um, indication of the energy scale, at least that. And, uh, and then, uh, obviously, you would like to find details in this spectrum and there are many, many possibilities. I gave you one example. I, I talked to you about a possible double peak, one at high energy and one at low frequency that can disentangle different effects. But of course, as usual in these cases, you would like to see some other uh, deviation or some other anomaly or some other discovery in a, in, independently. For example, if this double tension will be confirmed, that would be quite interesting. And if the nanograph signal will be confirmed, it will be quite interesting. So uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a proof in principle, but uh, uh, again, great expectation have to face a tough, tough reality. We will, we will see in this case what, what happens, but uh, 
um, I, I find in any case interesting that nature is providing a completely alternative route to new physics. Okay, thank you. We must move on. Let's thank Pasquale once more. Thank you. I will uh, try Pasquale, to... please unshare your screen. Yes, I will. So, so the next uh, uh, is by Massimo Bozzone. Quantum <laughs> correlations in neutrino oscillations. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for the, for the wonderful conference and the, for the invitation and the, for uh, the courage to organize the conference in such difficult times. And uh, I think we all enjoyed the excursion yesterday. And uh, this is something you cannot definitely have with uh, an online conference. So, okay, in the meanwhile. Okay, so. Um, this is it. No, I don't touch it. I just can tell you uh, uh, generally what I'm going to say. This is um, actually there are three parts in this talk, all uh, related to neutrino oscillations. And um, uh, we'll talk um, especially about the two papers which uh, came out recently with uh, different collaborators, and uh, also about some uh, earlier work we will. Uh, we will did you tell me I can go? Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's what we are the main topic, the disentanglement, uh, which is, uh, I will explain what, uh, what uh, I mean with this uh, term. And then, more in general, about the quantum correlations, and especially then we will check um, this in the context of the oscillations. Then I will mention uh, uh, recent work we have been, been doing on chiral oscillations, and then uh, in applications uh, of um, in, in oscillations, uh, uh, I mean, in uh, spin spin correlations, which is also another uh, manifestation of entanglement. And, uh, and I would like to say a few words about the um, neutrino oscillation formula, which is connected also with this, uh, because this was um, uh, somehow is uh, related to the previous talks of this conference by VTL and also by. Um, the, the previous talk about uh, Majorana. Okay, so what I mean by entanglement in neutrino oscillations? The topic of uh, entanglement in particle physics is uh, it's a really an important one and is uh, moving on very fastly, very rapidly. Uh, on one side, there is the necessity to move uh, to bring these uh, concepts, which are very developed. Now there is a big industry about uh, quantum correlations in the quantum optics and the related areas, to bring this to relativistic context and uh, hopefully also the quantum field theory, which is not an easy task. The um, entanglement, we have uh, we listened to the talk by Antonio Di Domenico, where uh, entanglement was a very crucial uh, ingredient for getting information about K-short in the experiments. So it's something real, true, that we can measure. And uh, entanglement uh, in early works, for example, by Kaiser, this, uh, the entanglement was uh, um, also before, um, acknowledged to, to exist in decay products. Okay, here we are, we are talking about something slightly different. This is an intrinsic entanglement, which is uh, arising in the moment we consider neutrino mixing, okay? And this is uh, actually, maybe we were the first to consider this. This is a, a early paper we published, and um, perhaps in a bit naive way, we, we put this forward saying that uh, when we have such a superposition, I take the simplest case, okay, then we have done all the variations and, uh, well, this uh, is actual entanglement. But, uh, you know, when I was uh, talking about this, people say, no, come on, you are wrong. Because you, you cannot have this, you, this is not entanglement, this is single particle. You have uh, Alice and Bob, they, have, they need something uh, with what to play each other. Okay, you need two particles, really. This is not entanglement. This is just a superposition. Observe that uh, here is intrinsic to this notation a, a tensor product structure of the Hilbert space. So if you do things carefully, this is a fundamental. Well, in the same years, um, sorry, yeah, the mathematical way we say this, because I open the book and I find that when a state you cannot write in this form, in a factorized the form, I, I find that this is an entangled state. Okay, that's the definition, okay, for general state, they can be even, uh, is a convex combination of the, uh, the states. Okay. Well, in the, I was saying, in the same years, more or less, a series of beautiful papers, for example, by Van Eng, by Drahl, and collaborators, etc., 
they actually showed that uh, because there was a debate also in the context of quantum optics that these kind of states are actually entangled they are the entanglement here is about field modes it's not uh, a matter of thinking of particles this is a problem if you think like particle like this is entangled with the vacuum which doesn't make so much sense and also i learned from these papers that entanglement is a property of composite systems and it's a property it's something that is as a relative meaning so we have to to understand what it's saying well so uh, this is the example given by by Vedral. You have one single photon hitting a photo, a, a beam splitter. So the photon is either here or there. So this is exactly the entangled state we have seen before. And then what do they do? They say, okay, but we can transfer this to atom, which is here in the ground state. So the atom will be either excited or ground state afterwards. And then we will have the two separated uh, objects with which uh, LS and Bob, they can play. And that's it. So you can do whatever they have done. I mean, they are doing this. Thing. So, um, well, we analyze the first. Uh, okay, here maybe. Yeah, it's, there is some strange thing because this uh, this was supposed to be at. Uh, uh, sorry, can you put uh, a full page, uh, not scrolling uh, mode? Because um, perhaps uh, this is, uh, you know, the, the in the in the um, document viewer. Yeah, and there should be the option uh, because with my computer, I see. Otherwise, it spoils all. Your, uh, because you see, it comes uh, not this, no, not tonight. Um, so what we did, we analyzed the, the entanglement properties with all the tools of uh, no, not continuous, not okay. Uh, I, you know, uh, uh, but this is not mine. <laughs> it's uh, that's a problem. <laughs> Bit difficult to improvise on this. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we considered the uh, the situation of entanglement. Uh, as uh, from flavor to mass you see so what it means entanglement is uh, is a relative concept you have to define with respect to it so here our qubits are the mass eigenstates so we did a lot of analysis here okay in this paper is contained but okay this is interesting up to some point this we call the static entanglement but we can play another game we can go to the flavor basis here is all unit there is one mechanics and we can define our um, our uh, qubits as the flavor states so generally the neutrino at a later time is an entangled state of uh, uh, the initial qubits how we measure this uh, uh, entanglement well we open the book we uh, there are many measurements but in this case it's particularly simple because it's a pure state bipartite it's very simple then problems arise in more complicated situation we write down the density matrix we reduce the density matrix uh, we calculate for example the simplest is the linear entropy this is one minus the purity of the state and uh, we calculate this and it comes a very nice thing so this linear entropy this is related to um, for Neumann entropy is just the product of the the um, the, the um, probability uh, um, the probabilities the transition probability so it's nice eh? because you take the amplitude you square you get the probability you take the product of a probability you get an entropy <laughs> for me it was quite uh, surprising and that's it I mean here are the oscillation probabilities this is the entanglement what is the this entropy telling you that at the here is zero at the beginning because you have a certainty what is going on and this is maximal when you are, don't know what is going on there okay very simple okay but what we do with this so we tried to imagine a way in according uh, according to the protocol of uh, how to transfer this to to charge the electrons so one should do this is very bit, bit naive perhaps we did this way how to, to transfer this to charged electrons in order to end up with uh, a charged electron um, single particle state which however um, due to the charge and the different mass of these objects perhaps could be specially separated because the problem of uh, differently from the photon the problem of neutrino is that this is intrinsic and this also not specially separated so it's really something very deep it's intrinsic to the, the fundamental part so instead of having which path uncertainty in the federal case, we have which flavor. But okay, we didn't do anything more on this. We, we have uh, several, however, generalization, essential to one of the theory. We have, we have done some work on this. Okay, now recently, however, um, the community got interested in this uh, uh, kind of results and uh, generalized and then went on uh, quite a lot in a more general framework, the framework of quantum correlation. Quantum correlations are uh, more general than entanglement. Entanglement is a particular kind of correlation. So there is a, 
a whole uh, industry uh, related to this quantum correlation to classify them and to put uh, uh, to understand well what are the resources they really give to us for example band locality quantum steering entanglement are one family uh, quantum discord is a completely different beast it's uh, some uh, quantum correlation discovered by uh, okay, Zurich and Vedral uh, some years ago, we, which arise even when uh, you don't have entanglement, for example. This is very interesting, but I will not talk about this. Measure, me measures, one should be careful because measures are uh, also very delicate because uh, you, you distinguish from, for pure state, mixed states, uh, multipartite entanglement, etc. I mean, there is a, a lot of stuff. In more general terms, this is a recent review I um found interesting so there, there is a student who worked on this as she was uh, um putting in this context the things i i, I think it's very good because uh, the resource theory is a very general framework which tells you um you see you have uh, some operations this is very operational very practical that are called free operations whatever you can get which is not obtainable by free operations is a quant is a resource or in this case a quantum resource for example Alice and Bob, they can do whatever they want in the laboratory locally. They can communicate by telephone, they, they, no cost they, for free. They can do whatever they want. What they cannot get in this way by these operations, which are called the local operation, the classical assisted by classical communication channel, it's entanglement. That's very nice in this way. Well, one can classify complex, non complex. I, I will not uh, go into this. I want to stress that uh, this is not a partial list. The many papers recently appeared uh, are appearing in which uh, entanglement was studied in neutrino oscillations in the, in the spirit of what we were doing uh, initially. For example, um, this is very nice. They checked with experimentally the violation of legged guard inequalities. This is analog in the time domain of the Bell inequalities of. Uh, uh, this inequality is in neutrino oscillation, proving that uh, once more that the phenomenon is quantum. We know that this is a really quantum phenomenon, but how much quantum? We have to, to quantify this. And um, in particular, this paper it took our interest, so um, I put a student to work on this, uh, where they um, use different quantifiers of coherence. And there is this one is a bit strange, a bit complicated to understand this, called the no local advantage of quantum coherence. There is a hierarchy of these things. Anyway, it's related to steering. I don't want to, to exaggerate here because I want to tell other things, but uh, basically the coherence in general is defined uh, with respect uh, with the L1 norm to the um, orthogonal elements of the density matrix. So one can define from this some quantifier. This quantifier can, can have a bound. When it exceeds this bound, like for Bell inequalities, you see this is it exceeds some bound, then you say that, okay, there is a strong no locality going on there. So what they did, let me show you the, the plots. They analyzed Dia Bay and Minos. These are the two experiments. This is in their paper. And they found a very good agreement with the violation in some regions of these uh, quantifiers. And they also, they, they deduced that uh, the no local advantage of quantum coherence is the strongest one. So really here, there is something very, very strongly uh, quantum going on. What we can do with this, I don't know. <laughs> this is one problem that we have now, but we want to understand. Okay, so what we did, uh, this was the thesis of this uh, student, the master thesis, she generalized this using uh, uh, wave packets, which they didn't do. And uh, what we found, it's quite interesting, because we find that uh, putting the, the, um, the wave packet information, the localization information into this, the first experiment is uh, reproduced quite well, by the, the um, Chinese group. This is a dependence on sigma, I cannot go into this. But you know, for what concerns non local advantage of quantum coherence, uh, we get uh, quite different uh, in the long uh, um, distance behavior. And um, you see, this is uh, um, in agreement, much more in agreement with the experimental points, which we don't have, however, but we, we have to do a fit, which tend to be up here and they are not fitted by there. So in this case, it seems to be. A, a much better fit uh, by wave packets. And we observe a very interesting phenomenon. In the long distance, the no local quantum advantage you see in the minus is violated, it's above the limit. In the case of uh, 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 Diabe, it's not violated. This is very interesting. So we find that we found that this is related to the mixing angle only, it's a function of the mixing angle. And we found a critical angle for this. This is published here. 
Um, but again, we don't know now operationally what this uh, means. They should be uh, should have necessarily something to do with some something you can do more in one case than in another. Clearly, the mixing angle is bigger in the case of minus. Okay. Let me tell a few words about chiral oscillations because I want to, to show an applications we have done in this uh, context. Well, chiral oscillations, uh, I, this is uh, work done with my Brazilian colleagues. In particular, Bernardini was working uh, quite a lot on this in the past. And uh, well, chiral oscillations, they are a quite straightforward uh, consequence of, uh, of um, Dirac equation. The problem is that they are almost unobservable. I mean, they are very small in the relativistic limit. The problem, but however, it comes that now uh, we are much uh, uh, into non relativistic neutrinos, especially in connection, in particular in connection with, uh, uh, I mean, in the future, right? of course, we don't have the experiment. Problem is already in preparation. I think I don't know when it will be. So the cosmic neutrino background is made of extremely non relativistic neutrinos. This is uh, acknowledged. And so we found that this is uh, very relevant, this uh, dynamics of chiral oscillation in that uh, context. And uh, this was uh, the result obtained simultaneously by other two uh, researchers here. So they found, uh, as we, a factor, a reduction of factor two for the flux. Unfortunately, this is the same for Majorana and uh, Dirac, so it does not help distinguishing, but it should be taken into account. It's a big effect. So outcomes, if you do things in the chiral representation, um, and, uh, yeah, thank you. If you do things in the chiral representation, it's simpler, and you write down the Dirac equation, and you find this uh, oscillation. So how how they are made? They are made like this. They have a, 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 an amplitude which is energy dependent. Here is the minimum of the oscillation. You see the survival of a bit. You see uh, this is in the unit of mass. So you have to really to go down to the order of mass to see something significant. Otherwise, it's uh, basically one. It's, uh, the particle is every time there. And also the, the oscillation length is very small. So basically you consider averages. But anyway, this is there. This is only with one generation. You don't need any, any. And we, we worked the, um, in detail the case of Majorana, where of course the oscillation also not between left and right, but with the left and the, the conjugate of the, the, the yeah, the covariant defined conjugate. Well, when you put in also the flavor oscillations, it becomes very interesting. Mm. So here we take into account the flavor oscillations of the Dirac equation with all their bispinorial nature of the, we consider Dirac neutrinos for simplicity. But when you do this, you get the flavor oscillation form, which is the standard oscillation term, and then there's two contributions which depend mm, partially, partially on this uh, chiral oscillation. In fact, they also reproduce a correction we found in the context of quantum field theory, which I want to talk at the end, where we didn't consider, however, the chiral nature of the weak interaction. So the weak interaction basically is at the origin is projecting this large eight component by spin, if we consider two flavor, because we have two. It's projecting this first on one flavor, if we start in a definite flavor, and then on one chirality, and then oscillates. And we have these quantum numbers, which have a very interesting in, under, in, interplay. Okay. And this is what we uh, we applied. Uh, so we, we did this application, imagining, considering a pi on decay, in which you produce an entangled pair of uh, uh, a lepton generically and antineutrino. OK. So you see, at equal 0, uh, see, so here the color indicates uh, chirality. One should be very careful, because when mass is non-zero, <laughs> chirality is different from elicit. It's completely another thing, of course. We all know. And this is the spin, you see. Here is a small term, of course, depends. If mass or neutrino mass is zero, this you don't have, as we all know. But when uh, uh, things, you move on with time, you know, we have this beautiful, uh, I would like to make animated uh, psychedelic thing. So the, this uh, um, uh, oscillates into different colors while keeping the other things uh, uh, standing. Okay, so what we did here, is we create a state, a singlet state in the origin, we project, sorry for putting the calculations, but if somebody wants to, to, to look, I wanted to, to have there, we project in the chiral, with the chiral projectors, of course, for the lepton and the antineutrino, they are the opposite, the realities, and we go, we, we, okay, what we get? We get a, a, we're getting a French momentum, we get a four qubit entangled state. Initially, this is entangled only in the spins for construction. We construct like this. There is only spin entanglement. 
because you see the blue is every time here and the red is every time here but spin once is here once is there and this is not factorized let's say the color is factorizable okay that's the, the meaning when we and we calculate this we i, I spare you the, the the details with the negativity and we show that this entanglement is uh, well defined and we check everything reduce the density matrix negativity when we uh, evolve in time chiral oscillations take place now what happens that these chiral oscillations transfer take part of the entanglement from the spin the initial entanglement in the spin and then transfer to entanglement between chiralities but then what we do we trace over chiralities and we measure the spin spin correlation and we find that they have the effect of uh, uh, chiral oscillations and this is particularly nice we even check uh, that uh, there are uh, several checks we do in the various bipartitions that the entanglement is really going where it's going and where it's staying i mean what is uh, because it's a transfer of entanglement in time and uh, then we find this you see these are the parallel oscillations but look at this this is spin spin co and correlations um okay here for momenta bigger than the neutrino mass uh, basically you have nothing then uh, you see oscillations here you move in time in the spin spin correlations which an amplitude which is quite big you see from zero seven to zero here is almost zero and then uh, uh, it becomes maximal the correlation but the amplitude the oscillation becomes very small so there is a sort of resonance we see this even better with uh, a, a um, bell observable where there is a real resonance of these oscillations at the mass of the neutrino and we find this very very nice because uh, you can explore a, 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 a completely fundamental uh, quantity which is the mass of the neutrino looking at the spin correlations of the products well, here, the only problem here you have to look at the spin of the neutrino as well but we can do we plan to do different things we plan to trace also over the neutrino degrees of freedom and to look only at the single particle correlations in time via like the guard of the electron which is easy to see so if one has the sensitivity then one should be able to read the, the, uh, the resonance in the in the correlations at the neutrino mass okay so in the few that's it i mean if you uh, want more details we can talk later i want just to show you a um, few words about this uh, um we have we have said that uh, solving the equation we find the complete formula even taking into account the chirality of the neutrino state well where where these corrections they come from well here we have uh, a long uh, story because uh, um, we have been doing the quantization of the mixed fields in a canonical formalism and this is exact what i'm going to say so when you quantize the fields with different masses and you look for the Hilbert space of fields with uh, different uh, with uh, flavor definite flavor you you define your generator you find a surprise you find that the two Hilbert space are orthogonal and this is a condensate of the particles with uh, different masses so what is going on here the annihilation operator for the fields with diff with specific flavor definite flavor is not simply the sum of the two but there is a bogolubov inside and this bogolubov coefficient is nothing but that uh, products of wave functions the wave function with different masses here everything is uh, no hypothesis nothing this is just a standard model so this mixing transformation is a rotation plus bogolubov transformation okay this is the rotation and this is bogolubov transformation the key point and this is the generator we found there we can write in terms of this elementary algebraic object the key point is that these two operations, two transformations, they don't commute. So Bogolubov and Pontecorvo don't commute. If you expand this vacuum, you find the first term, which is analogous to BCS, but you see, this is uh, different uh, couples. So this is somehow creating some problems with Lorentz invariance. We analyze this in another context, but that's not the talk of today. How we calculate the relation formula? In Eisenberg picture, this refers to the previous talk, because uh, Sharing a picture is a bit problematic in this context, but I said picture is very fundamental. We know if we do a, a, a current, a major current analysis of this simple Lagrangian with mixed mass term, we of course we know that we don't have uh, conserved uh, charges. We have only overall conserved charge, global charges, and we can define the flavor charges. Thank you, which are very simple in terms of the flavor fields. Okay, this is uh, you can do it. This is classical. You can do it in two lines. 
when, well, we ask now, what are the operators in which these operators here, which are time dependent, of course, the sum is conserved, are diagonal? And these are exactly the operators we have found before. So this can be checked, it's exact. Okay. So if we define our neutrino state at the reference time in the Eisenberg picture as the flavor eigenstate, as should be in the standard model, I calculate the expectation value of the charge at a later time, and I get this. So and all, all in terms of anti-commutators, so there is a very neat uh, result. This is already quite old. And we have a term, which is the ponte Corvo term, with a Bogolubov coefficient in front, which is almost one, let's say. And then we get the sum. So this is like two harmonic oscillators, classical. You have the difference, and you have the sum. Quantum mechanics gives you only the leading, the, the main frequency. It's correct, but it's not exact. That's it. So, and this is, agrees perfectly apart from chirality, because here we don't have the information about chirality. These are not chiral charges. If we put the chiral character charge, we would get the same. This agrees with the uh, Dirac equation, of course, because the Dirac equation is correct. So, uh, so okay, then, um, yeah, there are many results, but I, I would stop here. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question. Yes, please. Uh, with the Majorana neutrinos would be different. No, the formula is the same. We hope very much to find some corrections with the Majorana fields in this uh, generalized context, but unfortunately, we, we <laughs> find that it uh, looks very much the same. Also, the chiral oscillations, they look uh, really the same. Uh, it's very difficult to work. Yeah. Um, so I have. Uh, okay, uh, yes, okay. Uh, in the first part, you are saying you are checking quantumness, I don't insist. So, I read many of these papers. So, you can introduce some new quantities which uh, you say that uh, that is kind of test of quantumness. But what I realized that uh, with this, you are not going beyond just standard oscillation formula with interference term. That's it. So, so all these kind of additional tests are not going beyond this have interference. You are, you are right. You are, you... Mm, no, it, it can be, no, okay, it's quantum mechanics, you are right. If you are in quantum mechanics, it's quantum mechanics. If you go to quantum field theory, then you will have a general, quantum field theory is more general than quantum mechanics, that's my issue. But, uh, okay, but the problem is, uh, you are perfectly right. The problem is, what do we do with these things? If they are all function of a quantum, of a, a probability, oscillation probability, where is the extra information? Well, no, no, it's not so simple because I, I would be careful. Um, first of all, you see, you have a, a hierarchy of these kind of things. So, uh, sure, I mean, you, we have shown that, for example, the, okay, here doesn't work anymore, sorry. But, um, for example, the non local quantum advantage is definitely stronger than the Bell non locality test. Uh, well, okay, somewhere. And, uh, and others, but uh, this is at present is not very clear. Yeah, you see here, this is an hierarchy. For example, if you have, uh, in general, forgetting about the neutrinos, if you have a state which has no, no local quantum advantage that is uh, exceeding the bound, this uh, means that that state has a di different from zero no local quantum advantage, but not uh, steering, it can be also, the, the quantum discord can arise where there is no entanglement. So these things should be taken into account. In the context of neutrino oscillations, honestly, at the present, I don't know what this can give uh, real information, but I wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't dismiss like this, I mean, given the amount of work which is going on. This yeah. Was actually, I was a referee of this paper. Uh -huh. You start with something, with some data, and you end up with the same, which kind of all this long analysis will not bring anything new. Well, let me ask you so second file, second question. So you were saying about this uh, uh, factor of two for a relic neutrinos in yeah. the case of Majorana in Dirac. So oscillations has nothing to do with this. It's just conservation of uh, helicity. No, excuse me. No, there are two factors. <laughs> no, no, sorry. I know what you refer to. Uh, I mean, in the paper, for example, by Vissano, other people, there is this factor two. There's a difference from Majorana to neutrino. This is one thing. No, no. I'm talking another factor two in the paper here. We are talking on overall factor two 
which is uh, to be put on the flux because the neutrinos which are produced left-handed, they average, they all go right-handed and they average. And this you do, and this is also in the paper by Pasquini, if you don't believe ours. So the number of okay, so let's so there are two. Okay, so in the chiral oscillations, your chiral oscillations, yeah. what is the uh, energy difference which drives this phase difference increase? No, oscillations yeah, this, this, for, no this is for single part. This is, this comes because of, and it must the Dirac must turn or the Majorana must turn. You flip left turn. Let me just repeat the question. So for oscillations, you need to have phase which changes, right? So which means that you have phase difference more precisely. You have uh, so two components and phase difference. So I have a simple question. This is total energy, right? Which is no, the this is energy? Yes, this is so, square root of yeah, it's it has no sense of these oscillations. We can discuss this later. Okay, thank you. Let's see. We have, we have a question from online. The question from online. Uh, yes. Uh, hi, Massimo. This is Nick. Uh, Nick from Romano. Uh, nice talk. Uh, one quick, two quick questions. The first is I didn't understand when you were talking about quantumness. You, these experiments are using the mass eigenstate vacuum, not your flavor vacuum. Am I right? Or. Uh, no, I mean, this context is irrelevant because in any case it's relativistic, so the two formulas... Yeah, yeah, but that's my question. If you use the if you use the flavor vacuum, you get the modification. No, no, no. In this case, no, you don't get any In this case, you don't. Okay. So my no, no, second, uh, so my second question uh, uh, concerns uh, the Majorana neutrino case. Uh, useless in the analysis of the data, but uh, in fact, uh, you see, we see a difference. So the... let's make it okay. quick. Yes. Okay, oh, and the... Uh, so, so, sorry, sorry Mashma, can you hear me, or...? Yeah, I can hear, but uh, there is another question. Uh, yeah, Nick, I have to go, because I, uh, I, I I need to ask a question, actually, yeah. Yeah, but I haven't finished. Okay, yeah, you can ask quickly, but because I haven't finished mine, okay. Yeah, okay, anyway, so, so this uh, uh, problem, so whether you like to go from one basis to another, uh, is related to flavor covariance, for many formalisms, that means the uh, Georg uh, Ziegler, I mean, not only neutrino oscillations, but only transport equations, and also what we have done with the flavor covariant transport equations. Uh, actually, it's related to uh, what Nick says, and it seems that we have to uh, receive what you, you had, uh, but it seems that you uh, have to single out in the mass, mass basis, okay? And from there, I mean, these neutrinos are not massless, are massive, heavy neutrinos and all that stuff, to develop a fully flavor covariant transport yeah. equations with a proper um, uh, commutation relation or the commutation relation for fermions and so on. So, but we don't see any other phenomenon. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I appreciate the, the thing. I want to just to say, it's clear that you have to make a choice in the moment we have a twin equivalent representation. Problem is which choice? If you choose mass, you will have at three level in the vertex, in the charge of current the vertex, a violation of flavor. That's all this I get. So if this is not a problem, yeah. Well, okay. for, for me it's a problem because uh, I think flavor is, okay, but this is a, a, you see, there is a problem of choice. You make a choice, you do calculations. In any case, uh, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, there is no opinion up to this moment, there is no can I Can I continue my question? Calibration of the neutral in the source will solve the problem. So we see, yeah. we see what is the vacuum. Massimo, can I continue my question because I was well, in the Okay, my well, question is in and I'm going to ask it. <laughs> so I think everything you did was with two neutrino states. So going to three, I don't see much changing, but it allows a complex phase in the mixing. Is there a different handle you would have on that? You mean that in the quantum correlation uh, so, business or in the particle theory in the last so, part? You know so I in, in your approach, using entanglement and quantum mass correlation. Yeah, they are, they are really two separate things. But I mean, the, yeah, but the, the, if there is a phase in the mixing matrix, of course, it's much, uh, much more complicated. than uh, there are subtleties in the three flavor case. The st vacuum structure is extremely intricate. But uh, I wouldn't say there are fundamental differences. I mean, apart uh, from the usual difference between uh, you have a CP violation, I mean, uh, of course. Okay, okay. Thank you, let's uh, thank Massimo one more time. Uh, we, we have to move on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker.
The next speaker's in the garden. <laughs> I will share my screen, right? Yeah, someone in the garden. Uh, I'm trying to share it. Okay. Share. Can you guys hear me well? We can hear you. Okay. So, okay. Just do the pointer. Okay. So let's start. Um, my name is Eric Brit Kamera, and I would like to, first of all, thank the organizers for letting me speak here in Corfu. So thank you very much. So the title of my talk is Tell Neutrinos with University Saw and a Billion Flavor Symmetries. This is based on a paper that was published in JHEB this year. It was a work done in collaboration with professors Ricardo Felipe and Philip Joaquin from CFTP in Lisbon. So the main focus of our work is the inverse saw mechanism for neutrino mass generation, which is implemented by adding to the sun mole particle content two species of cell singled fermions. So we are going to have the usual right-handed neutrinos nu r, and a second species that we dubbed cell singlet s. So the generic inverse cell mass Lagrangian has the following form, where besides the charge left and mass matrix ML, we are going to have three types of neutrino mass matrices. The first one is the direct type neutrino mass matrix MD. The second one is MR, which will have the typical scale of the heavy cell neutrino masses. And the last one is a Majorana mass term for the cell singlets S, and therefore it's a lepton number violating parameter that can be naturally small in the total sense. This will lead to the full neutrino mass matrix M, which has the following pattern for the inverse cell case shown here. Now we are going to work in an approximation that we call seesaw approximation. We're going to assume that the MD and MS scales are much smaller than the MR scale. And this allows us to block diagonalize the full neutrino mass matrix and obtain the effective light neutrino mass matrix for inverse seesaw. The dependence with the scales of the active neutrino masses M nu is shown here. Now let's do a little comparison with the type one seesaw case. You notice that inverse seesaw provides additional suppressing factors for the light neutrino masses. We're going to have an additional one over M factor and a small lepton number violating parameter mu s. Therefore, taking order one Yukawa couplings, uh, direct Yukawa couplings and mu s at the one EV scale, we can accommodate the active neutrino masses, which are typically at the 0 0.1 EV scale by having only M at the TV scale. Therefore, inverse cell is a low-scale neutrino mass generation mechanism. This will have phenomenological consequences that we are going to delve into later during the talk, but the most direct one is on active style neutrino mixing. So the heavy light mixing parameter depends with the scales as MD divided by M, which is basically the same dependence as the time one T-cell case, but here we have M at the TV scale. Therefore, we are going to have sizable active style neutrino mixing. In our work, we focus on a minimal setup which is inverse CSO22. We only add two right-handed neutrinos and two cell single fermions to the standard model particle content. And within this framework, we're always going to have a massless neutrino. However, the oscillation data and the charge lepton masses can be easily accommodated. Once we perform the parameter count in the MS diagonal basis, inverse CSO22 provides a priori 17 parameters. And this must be compared to the seven observables we are going to have which are namely the two neutrino mass square differences and the observables that parameterize the lepton mixing matrix, which are the three mixing angles, a Dirac charge parity violating phase delta, and a single physical Majorana phase alpha, since in inverse you saw to two have a massless neutrino. In order to check the compatibility with oscillation data, we use the, the one reported here in this table the, that was obtained by the Valencia group in Spain that performed the global data analysis, and they assume also the two neutrino oscillation paradigm. So now the main idea of our work is to try to reduce this number of priori parameters to make our model a bit more predictive. So we're going to use flavor symmetries and namely a billion ones, global ones. So they can be U1 continuous groups or discrete ZN symmetries. All the relevant mass terms for our work, which are ML, MD, MR, and MS will be generated dynamically. That means that their origin comes from a Yukawa interaction that involves a scalar field that acquires a non-zero vacuum expectation value. And once we impose the abelian symmetries, which are basically phase transformations for complex fields, each Yukawa interaction will lead to an algebraic equation for the charges that can be fulfilled. That, that, that means that that interaction will be present in the Lagrangian, or it can be different from zero. Therefore, the abelian symmetry will forbid that term from appearing in the Lagrangian, and this will lead to texture zeros in the mass matrices, doing the objective of reducing the number of a priori parameters. 
Furthermore, in our work, we are going to focus on the spontaneous CP violating scenario. That means we are going to impose CP at the Lagrangian level and CP will be broken spontaneously by complex factor of expectation values. So the minimal scalar content required to implement this idea is of a second Higgs doublet. This is necessary to be able to realize non-trivial charge left and mass matrix patterns by means of abelian symmetries. And we also add two complex scalar singlets, S1 and S2, that will distinctly generate the MS and MR scales, which are the scales relevant for the inverse C sum. So this leads to the generic Lagrangian they're going to focus our work on. The abelian flavor symmetries will restrict our analysis to this type of Lagrangian, because it will lead, once spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs, to the generic mass Lagrangian for inverse C-sol. Furthermore, if we limit our analysis of the scalar potential to a U1 symmetric part, we are going to have massless Goldstone bosons. In order to avoid that, we add soft breaking terms to scalar potential, and this opens the possibility for spontaneous CP violation, which is achieved by a non-trivial Xi1 phase, which is the phase that appears in the VEV of the single test one. Having established our framework, fermionic, scalar, and the main idea, now we perform the, a systematic search for the maximally restrictive texture sets of mass matrices ML, MD, MR, and MS, which are compatible with oscillation data, charge left and masses, and realizable by means of abelian symmetries. At the end, we only found five realizable cases that are shown in this table here. I also present the charges for the fields that transform under the flavor symmetry group GF. Notice that we have three uh, abelian groups. The first U1 restricts our analysis to the inverse C-SO case. This ZN symmetry, just a discrete symmetry that is uh, present in the Lagrangian, but it fails at forbidding the terms that are not part of the inverse C-SO uh, case, and they ultimately fails at imposing the flavor structure. The last U1F is the one that is responsible for by imposing all the flavor pattern in our work. So notice that from the five cases, four of them contain the four 3L charge left and mass matrix, which is slightly disfavored phenomenologically. So moving forward, there really is only a single interesting case to be analyzed, the one containing the five 1L charge left and mass matrix. So from this Yukawa Lagrangian that I presented, we can obtain the mass matrix Yukawa decompositions for this case, which are shown in this table. Now let's look closely at them. First of all, in the charge left and mass matrix, notice that the 2 2 entry corresponds to charge left and mass, which is a decoupled state. Therefore, we have three possibilities electron, mu, n, and tau times the two neutrino mass orderings leads to six distinct cases to be analyzed. And once we perform the rotation of the left handed charge left and fields, which is the one that is relevant for the left and mixing matrix, this case provides only a single physical parameter, the rotation angle theta L. As I mentioned, we are going to work with spontaneous CP violating case. It means I will impose CP at the Lagrangian level. And since we are dealing with abelian symmetries, this is equivalent by having real Yukawa couplings and also real scalar potential couplings. I showed that this VEV configuration with the non-trivial phase Xi coming from the VEV of the single test one is possible. And this will generate dynamically the MD, MR and MS matrices. From them, we can obtain the effective light neutrino mass matrix for the inverse seesaw. First of all, you notice that the phase Xi coming from the VEV cannot be rephased away due to this first entry. That means that spontaneous CP violation is successfully communicated to the leptonic sector by means of neutrino scale interactions. Now let's perform the parameter count uh, for this case. We're going to have the rotation angle theta L, that makes one. The phase Xi and four other parameters, X, Y, Z, and W, making a total of six effective parameters that must be compared to the seven observables can also be shown that these six effective parameters are entirely written in terms of the oscillation observables. This implies that there will be a, a correlation between two low energy neutrino oscillation observables and the said relation is shown here for the three charge left and decoupled cases. Therefore, now we are going to study leptonic CP violation. You notice that by looking at these two plots, just glancing at them, that the delta and alpha phases are strongly correlated in our framework. Furthermore, Dirac and Majorana type CP violating effects has a common origin in our work that lies in the complex VEV of the single test one. This implies that if there's no Dirac CP violation, there will be no Majorana CP violation. You can, you can see, for example, uh, by looking at the left plot for the delta equals 180 degrees point, we're going to have alpha equals zero, 180 degrees or two pi. Uh, and this can also be checked analytically by calculating the jark sog invariance for Dirac or Majorana type CP are both proportional to the, to the phase psi coming from the VEV. 
these two cases that I show here, which is normal ordering mu on the left and normal ordering tau on the right, are the most interesting ones because there are intervals in which a future measurement of VELP would exclude both of these cases, making our model falsifiable. I mentioned just very briefly that in the paper, we also analyzed neutrinos of beta decay. Another consequence of abelian flavor symmetries is that they will lead to relations between the heavy light mixing parameters, which are encoded in these B matrix elements that appear in the charge current as well as the neutral current interactions. The relations between the heavy light mixing parameters are entirely written in terms of the oscillation observables. And using best fit values for them, we can obtain this numerical estimate shown in this table. This allowed us during our analysis to establish relations between muon and tau charge left and fair violation decays. However, during this talk, we are solely going to focus on muon charge left and fair violation. And more specifically, on the mu gam, mu T3, and mu conversion in aluminium, titanium, and gold processes. Notice that muon charge left and fair violation present the most stringent current bounds as well as lowest future projected sensitivities. We are going to include experiments such as MAG, mu 3 e Syndrome 2, Comet, etc. Starting first of all in a plane of parameters that is M45, mu S, M45 is the sterile neutrino masses, and mu S is the lepton number violating parameter. Basically, it's a plane of parameters that is relevant for the scales that appear directly in the Lagrangian, the MR and MS scales. Here I present the results for inverted ordering on the right and normal ordering electron on the left. Looking now at the left figure, you notice that the future MUI conversion experiments, uh, which are Comet, Prism and Prime, mu 2 e uh, they will be able to probe the conversion rate of MUI in titanium up to the 10 to the minus 18 level. And by doing so, they will, be, uh, they will scrutinize almost the entirety of our model's parameter space for the normal ordering electron case. Looking now at the right figure, notice that the blue shaded region will remain unprobed by future indirect charge left and fervating searches, and therefore it is a less optimistic case. But now uh, let's shift to another plane of parameters that is a bit more physical. Specifically, the M45 cell neutrino masses VN squared heavy light mixing parameter plane. It's more physical because the branching ratios of the processes that I just mentioned depend directly on these quantities. So besides the indirect charge left and fair lighting searches uh, I mentioned now, I will include a bunch of other experiments. The left figures will contain the current constraints, the right ones, the future projected sensitivities. We are going to include uh, collider constraints coming from hadronic colliders, A plus and minus colliders, and linear colliders. To cite a few examples, CMS, Delphi, Atlas, the high luminosity LHC phase, international linear collider, and the FCCE, etc. We are also going to include beam dump experiments and displaced vertex proposals like NA3, CHARM, Matuzla, Phaser 2. And last but not least, we also consider the electric precision data constraints, which has to do with the non-unitarity of the left and matrix, whose diagonal elements are mainly constrained by gauge boson decays and universality tests in pion and tau decays. So uh, now let's focus on this case, which is normal ordering electron. Looking at the left figure for now, the electric precision data imposes basically a bound on mixing Vn squared of about 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six. Looking now at the right figure, notice that the future indirect charge left and fair lighting searches will be fully complementary to direct searches, for example, at the high luminosity Z factory like the FCCE. Let's move to the inverted ordering electron case. On the left figure, you notice that the electric precision data is less constraining. However, the bound on mixing Vn squared is about the same, 10 to the minus five, but it comes from current collider constraints as well as current indirect charge left and fair bounds. Now, if you look at the right figure, the future indirect charge left and fair searches will only be able to probe Vn squared down to at most uh, 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight. However, lower mixing regimes, which are in, inside uh, the blue shaded region, will be able to be probed by experiments such as SHIP, Matuzla, and FCCE. So to briefly conclude, we performed a comprehensive study of the minimal inverse cell model constrained by abelian flavor symmetries. Uh, we are working in a spontaneous CP violating scenario and all the relevant mass terms are generated dynamically. So this leads in our work to a correlation between Majorana and direct type CP violation. Furthermore, the abelian flavor symmetries provide a very constrained setup for phenomenological studies since they imply relations between heavy light mixing parameters. 
we analyze the constraining power of indirect charge left and fair lighting searches on our model's parameter space, but also included alternative probes which are sensitive to cell neutrino masses and heavy light mixing parameters. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm, I'm now open for your questions. Yeah? Thank you. Questions, Mr. Frampton? Have you considered also non-abelian flavor symmetries? Yes, but the, the objective of this work was to, um, this was my first paper, so I, uh, we worked with abelian symmetries. Uh, but yes, non-abelian flavor symmetry is also interesting, and I'm working on them not right now, yeah? But this is just a way to, to do it. So I, it would imply another model, and I, and I have to put other constraints. For example, if I take A4, I would need at least uh, three Higgs double to have uh, the Higgs in, in a faithful representation of A4, so it would require another analysis, so not a different model for completely, yeah. Other questions? Yes, in the back there. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, it's a very nice question, maybe. So um, does your model have any, um, let's say, uh, does it introduce anything new from the point of view of leptogenesis with these neutrinos? Uh, yes, probably yes, but uh, uh, we did not analyze the leptogenesis part. It's actually one of the things we, are, we, we thought at the time of doing, but we mainly focused on the charge left and uh, decays and processes. So you, you, at the moment, you cannot guess anything, let's say, too much concrete on this. I cannot, but I have uh, multiple scalar fields, so it might probably help or not. So, yeah, I must do the calculation, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, I see no more questions. Let's thank Enrique once again. Okay, thank you, guys. And all of the speakers in this session, and we will reconvene at 1530.